What's up guys, it's Dalmater here, and today we're going to be reacting to another History Dose video. So we're kind of continuing with the Vikings here, and this one we got the Irish versus Viking Wars. Uh, which is really interesting to me, because, you know, as a, uh, your resident Ameramut, or I guess Canada Mutt, not American, uh, you know, these are both countries that I have ancestry from, the, the Scandinavian countries and Ireland. Uh, so yeah, this is my ancestors, I guess, going at it, so I'll <laughs> link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. Real quick, you can lead your own head-to-head -head battles on the go with today's sponsor, Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, the tactical mobile game exploding in popularity right now. Please stick around toward the end of the video for more on how you can conquer the battlefields of the far future. The records of those days begin to repeat themselves. Plundered were the old shrines, ravaged were the lands. And when so many churchyards sat damp with the blood of holy men, when champions fell, when wives and children were taken into slavery, that was when Ireland knew what had washed onto her shores, when she understood the wrath of the Vikings. They arrived in 795, two years after they first struck England. Their fleets harried Ireland year after year, and these Norsemen grew more audacious. In time, they would establish permanent settlements along the coasts and waterways. Yeah, Dublin's probably the most famous of these, right? Now the capital of Ireland. Um, and yeah, it was, it was founded as a Viking outpost. Once sparsely populated, Dublin became a fortified and populous center of Viking power in Ireland. Connecting Irish shores with the outer world through a rich trade in goods, treasures, and slaves. These colonies were also bolstered by the arrival of Scandinavian royals, likely including Ivar the Boneless, who established their own ruling dynasties. But lasting Viking conquests beyond the coast would be... Yeah, so anyone that's seen the show Vikings, uh, very good show, but not very historically accurate. Uh, for example, there's, there's a lot of stuff, like a lot of the people in it were not related, or if they were, it was like very distantly uh, a lot of the people that are, uh, you know, in it are not alive at the same time, sometimes hundreds of years apart. Uh, a lot of the conquests that happen in it are sometimes, again, hundreds of years apart. Uh, so it's a very good show, but not very historically accurate. Uh, so yeah, if, if you know Ivar or Ivar the Boneless from the show, it's not a one-to-one -one portrayal of him. Although he was a real guy. Most of the characters in that show were real people, but they're, the timeline's all messed up, the relation ship with each other is all messed up and sometimes even made up uh, a lot of the time made up um so yeah good show not very historically accurate be difficult any who ventured farther inland trespass onto the lands of over a hundred petty kings in their clans the irish lived in so-called ring forts usually stone or earthen enclosures overlooking farmland and pastures dotted with livestock the people dressed in linens, belts, and woolen cloaks, and displayed status by the quality of their brooches. Although this island had come to embrace Christianity since the 5th century efforts of St. Patrick, the Vikings had not brought war to a saintly or tranquil country. Yeah, so they... It's interesting he talks about the brooches, because that's actually something that predates the, the Christianity. It's something that you see, like, in like, very early Celtic, if not pre-Celtic, uh, you know, people that would become the Celts, uh, the different Celtic tribes. So it, it's a very old tradition. Uh, and then, yeah, when he's talking about the Christianity, the Irish Christianity is fascinating because, you know, it, it's brought to the Isles, and then they become, uh, I shouldn't say country, because technically at the time it's a bunch of, like, small squabbling kingdoms and tribes and all this different stuff, but the, the island is one of the first places to be Christianized, right? But they have a very different form of Christianity where it's this kind of, uh, like, syncretism between the traditional beliefs and Christianity. And this does happen everywhere, but more so with the Irish than possibly any other group that gets, uh, that adopts Christianity. They don't actually become Catholic until much later. Uh, and some of the things that, like, for example, you're still allowed to have concubines even if you have a wife, right? There's not this kind of monogamy that you have within Christianity, right? It's, uh, it's very, some of it's similar to Catholicism, but it's also very different and very unique. It's uh, a very interesting 
uh, branch of Christianity if you ever want to look into it. The clans of Ireland plundered, raided, and fought incessantly for power. Here, a Viking warrior society found itself surrounded by an Irish warrior society. Vikings fought clad in helmets and various forms of armor, with spears, swords, and great axes. While Irishmen rarely fought with armor, relying on the agile use of small shields, spears, swords, and darts. While the Vikings slew their kings, raided, and exacted tribute, the embattled Irish struck back with such force that the Vikings were forced to forge alliances and play politics. To this end, Viking leaders sometimes married into the lines of Irish nobility, and some became Christian. But favor with one clan meant enmity with another, and coalitions rose against the Norsemen. Ousted yeah, you saw the Vikings do this basically everywhere they went, right? Like, a lot of them married into the different English noble and royal families, into the different Irish noble families, uh, into the French, right? The French is probably the most famous example, where you have Normandy, uh, which is where my mom's line comes from. They're, Nor they're English people. Well, actually... Let's do a little bit of my personal history here. So my, my great-grandmother uh, was born into a minor German noble family that had to flee after World War I, uh, flee from Germany. And then they ended up settling in England. But that family was actually had its roots in England, but, they, but those roots actually go to the Normans. Uh, she was a descendant of a guy called Aubrey de Vere, uh, who was possibly a descendant of Rollo. He claimed it, but there was no proof of it. But he was very close with William the Conqueror, so it's very probable that if not Rollo, then somebody else, the high status he was uh, descendant of. But regardless, the you know the 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 diff they intermixed with all these different people that they went into. The Rus is another example, right, where they went and uh, you know founded the Kievan Rus and intermixed with the Slavic people over there. From Dublin in 902, the Vikings then resumed raids with unparalleled aggression, recaptured Dublin, and made war on the neighboring kingdoms. It was told that neither veneration nor honor nor protection for God or for man was felt by this ferocious pagan people. They reduced the Irish to bondage and slavery. Many were the blooming lively women and the gentle youths, whom they carried off into oppression and bondage over the broad green sea. Alas, many infrequent were the bright and brilliant eyes that were suffused with tears and dimmed with grief and despair. At the separation of son from father, and daughter from mother, and brother from brother, and relatives from their race and from their tribe. The region of Munster bore much of this bloodshed, and from there rose the man called Brian Baru. The effusive histories of him. Brian Baru, he, is he the one the O'Briens are descended from? Because I know a lot of these uh, the f very famous common Irish last names, like the O suffix, right, or uh, O prefix, sorry, it, it, it means of, right, so kind of similar to how, like, in the Germanic countries, you have, like, different, uh, you know, the sun suffix added on, all right, in Ireland, you have the prefix O, which usually means descendant of, uh, so, like, the O'Briens are descendant of Brian, I'm, I think, that, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Brian, I might be wrong there, though. Him would say, bad was the luck of the foreigners on the day when that youth was born. In truth, Brian's father was the chief of the Delcas clan, and as Brian may have been the youngest of twelve sons, their regional throne was not destined to pass to him. But these were dark times, wars against rivals, and the Vikings claimed the lives of his father and many of his siblings. It came to pass that his brother Mathgavin assumed the throne and struck a truce with the Vikings. Brian, the later accounts told, would not have it. By day and night he hunted the Vikings, sleeping on damp ground, embracing the wild, exchanging kill for kill, until the number of his followers had fallen to fifteen warriors. The weary Brian then reproached his brother for making peace when their forebears would have made war. Mathgavin, in the Council of Chiefs, heeded his words. In 967, they met their enemies in great battle, breaking and beheading the fleeing Vikings until they came to the Viking town of Limerick. If Brian was brave and wise, he was not merciful. The fort and the good town they reduced to a cloud of smoke and to red fire afterwards. The whole of the captives were collected on the hills. Every one of them that was fit for war was killed, and every one that was fit for a slave was enslaved. Victory had proven their strength. 
Brian's brother reigned as king over all of Munster, but in 976, old rivals captured and executed Mothgavin. Whispers of the ancient world survived in Ireland. Although the pagan kings of yore were buried deep in earth and legend, their hallowed bloodlines were claimed by countless would-be kings, and old mounds, woods, and stones remained the objects of veneration. So it was- Yeah, so this is, uh what we was talking about earlier with the Irish Christianity and how it's kind of this like syncretism between the traditional beliefs and Christianity, right? It, it's not like continental Christianity at all. It's not like Catholicism. It wouldn't be, uh, or I guess at that point it probably wouldn't even have been considered Catholicism, but it wouldn't be like continental Christianity until much, much later. It was that Brian ascended to the kingship of his clan under the shade of their sacred tree. And with little delay, he gathered his forces. He raided a monastic island, slaughtering there the Viking ruler of Limerick and his sons. He brought ruin to his brother's killers and reclaimed authority over Munster. But the rise of Brian Baru had drawn the eye of the powerful ruler of the southern Enail. In name the High King of Ireland, Mael Shecknell II had valiantly forced the Vikings of Dublin to submit to him in 980. Now he raided Brian's lands and uprooted the sacred Dalcassian tree. No doubt furious, Brian sustained war with this new nemesis for years, all while continuing to subdue surrounding lands. He would harness the fleets of subject Vikings to carry his marauding armies into Mael Shecknell's territory. And in 997, after over a decade of animosity, the two kings made peace. It was agreed that Mael Shecknell would retain rule of the north, and Brian Boru would be king over the south. It was perhaps this shift in overlordship that stirred Citric Silkbeard, the Viking King of Dublin, into rebellion along with the province of Leinster. The might of Dublin had long laid dormant under Mael Shecknell. Now was a chance to test this Brian Baru of Munster. The King answered. In the closing days of 999, Brian Baru and his new ally, Mael Shecknell, marched toward Dublin. The Dublin Norse and the men of Leinster sallied out to confront them at the great pitched battle of Glenmama. The armies fought with dauntless courage, and the hills were painted with carnage. Hundreds fell to the victorious spears and swords of Brian's men. Brian then did to the Vikings as they had done to his people. His army spent the first days of the year 1000 burning and plundering Dublin its rich markets and stolen treasures. The army captured so many of the Vikings' women and children that a later record exaggerated that the Irish no longer labored at all, for all their farms were worked and meals prepared by these foreign slaves. In reality, Brian dealt pragmatically with these Vikings. When Citrix submitted to him, Brian allowed him to return to the throne of Dublin. Many of these so-called foreigners were gradually assimilating into a Norse-Irish people. Citric was in fact the son of Brian's wife, or former wife, from her previous marriage with the late Viking King of Dublin. Brian now just, secured the yeah. loyalty of his new subject. Oh, so this is fucking stepson, man. That's one of the things I always find hilarious about European history, is all these people are fucking related, right? Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, this king was fighting this king, who is also his, you know, half-brother, and fucking... <laughs> it's like so much of European history. Even World War One, it's like all these just different cousins fighting by marrying off one of his daughters from another marriage to Citric, making the rebellious Viking his son-in-law. Stepson All and the great Viking ports of Ireland now answered to Brian, hubs of commerce that provided him with wealth, fine ships, and warriors. Certain of his own strength, Brian contested the rule of male Shecknell in the north. The latter attempted to mount resistance, but ultimately conceded. So it was that Brian Baru became the High King of Ireland. The aging king made great journeys across his realm, securing the formal submission of recalcitrant kings and courting the favor of Armagh, the influential church said to have been founded by St. Patrick. There, a cleric bestowed on Brian the title Imperator Scotorum, Emperor of the Gaels. His high kingship begat relative peace. He busied himself building great forts and round towers and patronizing churches. But the ambitions of subject dynasties meant that there was nearly always a defiant lord in revolt. Catastrophe struck in 1013 when Dublin and Leinster again rebelled. Mael Shecknell aided Brian and marched to pacify Dublin, but some of his forces, including his son, were slaughtered by Citric. 
Citric then recruited Vikings from overseas to challenge Brian. Earls and warriors from the Orkneys and Isle of Man sailed into Dublin Bay. Some of these men had likely aided in the Danish conquest and brief rule of England months earlier. And in 1014, the graying King Brian, variously recorded between the ages of 73 and 88, mustered an army several thousand strong, with aid from a distant edge of the Gaelic world, an Earl of Northeast Scotland. Over the spring, they ravaged rebellious lands on the path to Dublin. Later histories frame the coming battle as a last stand for the fate of Ireland. Such overstatement notwithstanding, the threat of a revived autonomous Viking Dublin with foreign backing was indeed grave. The morning of Good Friday, Brian beheld this enemy across a plain. I mean, they might not be wrong that it's the battle to save Dublin, right? Because you, th you think about, or sorry, the battle to save Ireland. Because you think about like what happened when the English conquered, right? Not too much, not too long after this. And the language was basically eradicated, right? And the culture was basically eradicated. And you had this... Um, you know, new Irish culture kind of develop, and eventually they did rebel, and you obviously get their freedom. They're an independent country now, or at least, uh, you know, the majority of the country is independent now. Um, but, you know, had the, had the Vikings conquered them, you might have seen something similar. Right? You might have seen something like when the, the Normans conquered the English, where you have this, like, change, right? Like, old Anglo-Saxon England is obviously... Uh, very different from modern England or even, you know, post-Norman England, you know, 100 or 200 years after the conquest. Uh, you know, genetically, it didn't change that much, right? I think the average uh, Englishman only has like 10% Norman ancestry. They're, they're roughly 50-50 Celtic and Germanic, but, you know, about 10% uh, Norman. But like the Normans had a huge cultural influence. You probably, possibly could have seen the same thing happen uh, had the Vikings been able to establish, you know, a presence, a permanent presence there. Now, uh, maybe not because they obviously didn't have the uh, connections to continental Europe uh, that the Normans had, or the the um, bureaucracy through the church, right? Because they have a different church at this point that the Normans had, but it, it could have happened. So what if? They spread far, their Norse shields, mail, and helmets shining in the rising sun. Later accounts of the battle have it that the army of Brian, led by his son Merchad, met the charge of the Leinster forces, and the Viking flanks closed in. It was poetically told that in these roaring hours spent hacking and stabbing, men were so doused in blood as to be unrecognizable to their kin their spears became heavy with the hair of butchered enemies. Brian's son, Merchad, perished, but as the day darkened and the fallen lay in the thousands, the enemy fell back, some wading to their Viking ships, drifting away in the tide, only to drown. When victory was near, a band of Vikings made an assault on the king's position. An Icelandic saga tells an elaborate tale that it was the Viking Brodir who beheaded Brian, that the king's guard quickly avenged their leader. Wolf the quarrelsome cut open Brodeer's belly and led him round and round the trunk of a tree and so wound all his entrails out of him. Whatever the truth of that day, it was clear that Leinster and the Vikings were beaten, and the High King of Ireland, Brian Baru, was no more. So ended the Battle of Clontarf, widely hailed as Brian's great victory and sacrifice. The death of the king's heir left the dynasty to his other sons. Some record that male Shecknell regained the title of High King, but his authority would never be so great as Brian's. Citric, meanwhile, continued to rule in Dublin. The Norse settlements of Ireland remained centers of trade for many years. Why did that kill this guy? He's rebelled twice now. <laughs> ...to come, but their power had been increasingly curtailed and harnessed by the Irish. Probably, you know, a much part of it is that it's whoever, you know, the, the new powerful Bryans, the O'Briens. I believe it's the O'Briens. I might be wrong there. I'm going to check that at the end of this video. But, uh, you know, Brian's sons, they're probably just like, okay, it's, you know, it's our sister's fucking dipshit husband. We'll let him stay alive. For the subjugation of the Viking invaders and their descendants was not Brian's achievement alone. 
but that of many generations of Irish kings and warriors who refused to yield. Stories of rising conquerors are undeniably compelling, and I think that's why I find Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus so fun. You're thrown. I thought this was going to be like another Magellan TV ad or something. ...own into the grim, dark future of the Warhammer 40,000 galaxy. And it's your task to conquer the battlefields using tactical, fast-paced gameplay in the palm of your hand. You build your army collecting and leading over 60 legendary Warhammer 40,000 champions from 15 playable factions. I also love how engaged and passionate the player base is. Over 3.5 million people have joined the Tacticus battles. And you can join that player base anytime from anywhere, in fast-paced PvE campaigns, tightly competitive PvP battles, and collaborative boss fights under your guild banner. The game also features the super fun Adeptus Mechanicus faction, whose attacks combine arcane weaponry and mechanical cybernetic augmentations. With new modes and content frequently added, Tacticus is an ever-growing quality tactical challenge, and it's free to play. Please download from the link in the description and start conquering the battlefields of the far future. I'm gonna try that out at some point. We've been doing a lot of Warhammer. We actually haven't done that much Warhammer stuff lately, but we were doing a lot of Warhammer stuff for a while. It was really interesting seeing a, <coughs> not only a Warhammer, but a Warhammer 40k ad on a History Dose video. Um, but yeah, King Brian uh, Boru, uh, is he the one, uh, and the O'Neill, okay, I want to know if he is the one that the O'Briens descend from. Uh, House O'Brien, okay, yeah, so he's founded in the 10th century by Brian Boru, okay, so I, I figured as much, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so that was interesting. Very interesting video. Uh, surprisingly, I, I don't, like, I know a lot about Irish history when it comes to after the English start showing up. Um, and I know a lot about Irish history when it comes to, like, prehistory and, like, the paleo history and the genetics and stuff. But when it comes to, like, the like the the medieval history not involving the english i actually don't know that much and i probably should learn more considering that's part of my ancestry but i don't know maybe we'll, we'll start going down that rabbit hole but anyway let me know what you think below like comment subscribe i'll see you guys in the next one